in the Gulf. To eject Iraq from Kuwait, Western and Arab allies fielded the biggest army since Korea. They used the latest high-technology weapons guided by lasers and computers with pinpoint accuracy. The biggest air offensive since World War II, 100,000 sorties mounted to neutralize the Iraqi war machine. Deception, speed and power were the key to the 100-hour land battle. Using the most modern artillery ever. Nearly 200,000 Iraqi troops gave themselves up. Perhaps 100,000 died against 150 Allied troops killed in Desert Storm and Desert Saber. Of the present Gulf nations, Kuwait existed as long ago as 1757. What's now Iraq was then only three provinces of the Turkish Ottoman Empire south of Kurdistan. All opposed Turkish rule, and Lawrence of Arabia won many to the British side against the Turks in the First World War. Sheikh Faisal, in return, was promised an independent kingdom, the artificial country of Iraq, handed over in 1932. 1961, British forces land in newly independent Kuwait. Within weeks of that independence, Britain had been forced to send paratroopers and an armoured brigade to protect the tiny kingdom against a threatened Iraqi invasion. On this occasion, the rapid build-up pre-empted Iraqi action, but it also reinforced Iraq's belief that Western protection was merely to keep oil prices down. Thirty years later, Iraq's costly adventure against Iran meant she needed higher revenues to revive her wrecked economy. So another attempt to absorb Kuwait began. Iraqi forces moved in after Saddam Hussein lost his temper over Kuwaiti refusal to agree higher oil prices to pay for his disastrous war with Iran. Unprepared for the sudden order, his forces reached Kuwait City soon after dawn meeting fierce Kuwaiti resistance. But most of Iraq's 200 tanks supporting the invasion had too little ammunition to withstand a counter-attack. And immediate Allied intervention might well have ended Saddam's latest adventure then and there. Instead, the military build-up only began five days later as the West opted for diplomacy through the United Nations, which initially voted for sanctions against Iraq. Underestimating the strength of the new superpower détente was Saddam's first mistake. His traditional Soviet aid was no longer forthcoming. And Arab opinion united as never before. Even those traditionally less than friendly to the West, like Syria, condemned Iraq and backed that condemnation by sending troops to join the Allied forces. Only Jordan and the Palestinians appeared to back Saddam. That coalition made it possible for the Saudi King Fahd to invite American-led forces to mass in Muslim Saudi Arabia, eventually to free Kuwait. At sea, Allied warships hunted sanctions busters. Iraq had only one major export, oil, making it particularly vulnerable to embargo. Allied ships intercepted nearly 8,000 vessels, arresting 46. What is your cargo, please? What was your last port in the Gulf, please? Last port in Gulf is in Pujaira. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a safe trip. By September, events had taken a more sinister turn. Hundreds of Westerners had been rounded up in Kuwait, then brought to Baghdad to join foreign workers already detained there. They were hostages. Saddam called them human shields, there to deter Allied attacks on Iraqi targets. The captives were paraded on Iraqi television, but scenes involving British children merely angered Western allies. Unexpectedly, the unpredictable Saddam, scorned for hiding behind women's skirts by Margaret Thatcher, freed the hostages. The PLO leader, Yasser Arafat, anxious for credit in post-war negotiations, had persuaded Saddam that hostage-taking was counterproductive. 
Perhaps more importantly, Western moves to go one last mile for peace had convinced Saddam of American weakness and unwillingness to go to war, so human shield hostages would be unnecessary. Saddam had again miscalculated, and the countdown to war had already begun, with the United Nations setting a January deadline for Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait. At the end of the military build-up, Allied forces in the Gulf totaled three quarters of a million people, 3,500 tanks and nearly 2,000 combat planes. With two-thirds of them American, there was little doubt who would run the show. Saddam Hussein took personal command of Iraqi forces, having learned little from his blunders in the war with Iran, which left him with the world's fourth biggest army, but shattered his economy. Needing higher oil revenues to recover, he claimed part of Kuwait's oil wealth, invaded when he lost his temper with their refusal to give in and misjudged American resolve to eject him. Coalition forces were led by Norman Schwarzkopf, a blunt-talking, dirty boots warrior nicknamed Storming Norman or Bear. A veteran of Vietnam and Grenada, he did learn from American mistakes. Operation Desert Storm, his plan, covered more pages than the Manhattan telephone book and used football tactics as well as classic military ones to outflank the Iraqis. War began with a massive air offensive. 116,000 sorties aimed at Iraq's many airfields. The launching zones for its Scud surface-to-surface -surface missiles, its chemical, biological and nuclear installations, ammunition dumps, communications and Republican Guard bases. The sinister stealth bombers spearheaded the raids, a plane never seen in public before. Part of its role was the pinpoint bombing of important Iraqi establishments vital to Saddam Hussein's war effort. Establishments often close to populated areas where accuracy was vital to avoid civilian deaths. One particular target was this building, Iraqi Air Force headquarters in Baghdad. One of many missions flown in the teeth of opposition from Iraq's anti-aircraft batteries, a video camera on the attacking plane recorded a direct hit. Despite the technology, the missions were still hair-raising for the air crews. I watched uh, some very young men become middle-aged and uh, somewhat more mature uh, that particular night, and I've seen the same thing in the subsequent uh, nights. That sentiment was repeated many times as the realities of combat were faced. For Arabs on the coalition side, especially Saudis and Kuwaitis away from their homes, Allied air successes came as the first really good news of the crisis. A crucial part in the air offensive was played by the RAF tornadoes, 45 of them out of a total UK air fleet of 75. They had one of the most dangerous tasks, low-level bombing of enemy airfields to neutralize the Iraqi air force, which included some of the most up-to-date Soviet fighters. Like the Americans, being in action brought a camaraderie impossible to imagine in peacetime. Hi, Mom. We're back. Yeah. Well, as I was going to say, it ran on rails. It was well planned. You know, we achieved, uh, well, we're going to have to wait and see what we achieved, but, uh, you know, from, uh, from what we saw, it looked good. I want to go straight to a debrief, so we're uh, a little rushed at the moment. Will you please? We're, yeah. we're all back. The ground crews, as in past wars, worked like fury too, keeping the planes up to scratch. The tornadoes carried the JP-233 runway denial bomb to tear huge holes in airfields and scatter anti-personnel devices to deter anyone trying to clear up. Outgoing aircrew drew pistols to help defend themselves if they ended up in enemy territory. A number were taken prisoner after being shot down and were tortured for information about Allied air strategy. The RAF's particular campaign helped to persuade Iraq to withdraw many of its combat aircraft from the unequal struggle. Over 120 planes went to Iran and stayed there. The tornadoes continued to fly to attack a wide variety of targets.
Much of the bombing was at night. The outskirts of Baghdad were hit over and over. For the residents of this and other Iraqi centers, the air raids became a terrifying nightly ordeal, even though the international coalition continued to pronounce it was military targets that were being taken out. For the exhausted crews, the relief that almost all of them made it safe home every time was intense. Bombs on target. So uh, ho hopefully we've done some damage. All, and, uh, all to the war effort. Yeah. And uh, other good news. It is good news. Absolutely Don. cracking. Absolutely cracking. It's cheered the cheered the, uh, the guys that are here up very much so. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's all, all, all good stuff. It's marvelous. That's we're all took off. We all got back. At Dahran, Bahrain and other bases, most of the daylight hours were taken up with getting the planes ready for more sorties. Ground crews tirelessly checking them over, ensuring the Iraqis rather than technical hitches were the enemy. Low-level flying, the tornado's speciality, required supreme skills and the closest cooperation between individual pilots. Four miles. You can go in. OK. Happy with that. We've got a rolling looking front on there. Chaffing with that. Happy with that. Stand by. You can go in. Stand by. Okay. Two miles. Keep them going. OK. Keep Charlie. Looking good. 2.4 miles. Okay. Okay, on the Taking out airfields had required its own special training. The results, though, were spectacular. The phrase, pinpoint accuracy, was constantly heard. But all the evidence, even post-war, was that it was almost always achieved, cutting supply routes like bridges as well as blasting airfields and installations. Military spokesmen described how the operations were executed. Going into the target, this one happened to be relatively lightly defended. We had a number of bombers on the raid, obviously. We hit the target and hit it on time, as we're supposed to, and dropped the bombs as accurately as we were able. The nature of the target was such that uh, it burned quite nicely, and uh, we left it burning, and we all came home. The victor. Unglamorous, but a vital workhorse, retired from strategic bombing duties to perform a quite different strategic task. These are the fuel tankers of the air. In order that Allied combat aircraft could operate at maximum effectiveness, spend as much time as possible near and over their targets, they were frequently refueled in midair, a tricky business that was a regular feature during the 38 days of unrelenting bombardment. Three. Here too, pinpoint accuracy was what mattered. Well, and the RAF crews earned American praise. Royal Air Force is very much like the United States Marine Corps. Yet they're, they're very motivated. Uh, I would not want that mission that those guys fly because uh, they're down low, they're in the uh, AAA. Uh, it's a dirt mission and they're just doing a dynamite job with it. It, it takes real, real courage. Iraqi resistance was mostly ineffective. But several planes did bring back the scars of combat. And in all, six tornadoes were lost during the campaign. After the runway denial missions were mostly over, different sorts of bombs were deployed. And tornadoes also carried rockets for some of their attacks.
Day and night, the routine of the air assault continued. Planes to be serviced, airmen to face the most gruelling campaign since the Second World War. The Allies intended to guarantee victory by winning in the air. By the 10th day of the air offensive, venerable buccaneers arrived from Britain to back up the tornadoes. With them came the laser eyes out under the wings. This equipment would give the ultimate in precision guiding for bombs carried to the battle zone aboard the tornadoes. Out in the Gulf, meantime, a large part of the United States aerial battalions were based flying a lion's share of the vast number of sorties from huge aircraft carriers. Those sorties included planes equipped with early warning radar to give plenty of notice of any enemy fighter activity. As aircraft arrived and departed around the clock, it was astonishing just how few did not make it back from the bombing and strafing runs across Iraq and Iraqi-held Kuwait. Altogether, the war cost the Allies 51 planes. Flying's obviously pretty hazardous, but being on the deck of an aircraft carrier at such times clearly has its dangerous moments too. American carriers soon resembled the most hectic of commercial airfields, as places and paths were found for plane after plane, either preparing to fight or returning from a mission. The Americans also operated from land bases in eastern Saudi Arabia. All told, there were 1,800 Allied combat and backup aircraft involved in the war against Iraq. There was no shortage of targets to pick, but Scud missile sites became a priority. Here, hardened bunkers protecting Scuds are attacked. Watch for the Allied bombs zooming in from the bottom left. Mobile Scud launchers were hard to spot, but many were effectively dealt with. Pilots described, though, how intimidating AAA anti-aircraft artillery could be. It looks a lot like, uh, you know, lights, flickering lights, like Christmas lights or something like that when the AAA is coming up. And then uh, shortly after that, it looks like some... Uh, big uh, bomb fireworks or something like that going off. It was an awesome display, it truly was. On and on went the air offensive. At its peak, 2,000 sorties were being undertaken every 24 hours. And it wasn't just from bases to the south of Iraq. At least one NATO airfield in Turkey, on the enemy's northern flank, was also in use. Out at sea, the very latest in conventional weaponry was aimed at the heart of Iraq, Tomahawk cruise missiles. 291 of them were fired from US battleships, each missile costing half a million pounds. They flew hundreds of miles to their targets. Again, Allied commanders declared that only military sites would be hit. The view from the ground. Western TV crews were on hand to record the sea launch Tomahawks as they sped at 500 miles an hour over Baghdad. Okay. 
Smoke billows up after a missile finds its target somewhere in Baghdad suburbs. By night, as well as by day, the expensive missiles were dispatched. Each one carried its own onboard computer. Inside its memory, details of the location of the target are locked in. They were launched to impact an hour before spy satellites passed over the target area to take photographs, making accurate damage assessment possible. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, launch. Missile away! Yes, sir. The missile's job was to demolish the heart of Iraq's means of survival, like Baghdad's main power station. Airborne missiles were used alongside the long-range Tomahawks. This is on the front end of the weapon itself. This is the SRAM missile with a camera in its nose striking a hardened hangar. The first missile in this attack goes straight home. A second, however, wobbles before locking back onto its target and a devastating hit. General Schwarzkopf took particular pride in the precision with which his military could hit what they wanted, while not hitting people involved in non-military pursuits. I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq on this particular day. Keep your eye on the crosshairs right there. Look at here. Right through the crosshairs. And now in his rearview mirror, He admitted, though, the danger. The appropriate targets. Uh, we're being very, very careful in, in our direction of attacks to avoid damage of any kind uh, to civilian installations. It's going to happen. It is absolutely going to happen. There's no question about it. But we're doing everything we can to prevent it. And, and that's not carpet bombing by any definition. The effects on Iraq of the onslaught from the skies were catastrophic. As well as strict military targets, the Allies pounded everything that could help keep a war going. Power stations were a prime example. Government buildings were carefully picked out and wrecked. The results of the computerized precision targeting that the Allies employed to such remarkable effect. Baghdad suffered a blitz not seen since the last World War, though a strictly selective one. Communications were shattered. Not only was the Iraqis' military command and control structure knocked out, but the country's TV was forced off the air as well. The civilian population suffered badly. Fractured mains and sewers, compounded by heavy rainfall, had parts of Baghdad awash and prompted fears of disease. Bridges across the Tigris River came down as part of the Allied campaign to prevent military movements and disrupt supplies. There's no way of knowing exactly how many people died, for no matter how great the commitment to avoid such casualties, they did occur, as General Schwarzkopf prophesied. What the outside world saw of the damage done both to public and private buildings was strictly under the Iraqis' control. They maintained that Allies were deliberately hitting civilian targets, the truth seems to be that few stray bombs there were, but very few. What did happen was that people and property on the ground suffered a good deal from anti-aircraft fire which came down, and by incoming missiles destroyed in flight before they hit those carefully pre-programmed targets. Petrol dried up, ironic in a state which is one of the world's leading oil producers. But again, Allied bombing disrupted all aspects of life. Strangely, Western journalists who stayed in Baghdad reported little hostility from ordinary Iraqis, no matter how bad things got. Night after night, as Baghdad was intensively bombed, people took refuge in underground shelters and bunkers. For the ordinary people of Iraq, there was little glory, much misery in a country unable to defend itself against the mightiest military powers of the globe. Their president was assumed to be in his own well-guarded bunker, 
as he and his lieutenant struggled to command their military forces, most of them strung out in the desert under constant Allied bombardment. As the pressure on Iraq grew, so did the strain and danger facing those living in its cities and big towns. Although Saddam Hussein's support faded sharply after the war, during it there was much talk of loyalty, and there were sometimes signs of anger too. This is not a game! Those are human life! Human life! Enough of civilians! Even accidental damage could be as heartrending as deliberate attack. A rocket fell there behind us and uh, damaged our house, as you see. President Saddam Hussein will stay here and we will stay with him until the end of the war. And we will have our big victory here against America and other countries. Then, on February the 13th, a bunker in the Baghdad suburb of Amaria was bombed, and inside it died some 300 civilians, many women and children. The Iraqis declared it was well known to be an air raid shelter. It was a disastrous moment. Much of the Muslim world expressed outrage. America insisted, however, that the place was doubling as a military command center. Officials produced much evidence to support their opinion. A little later, a stray RAF bomb was to kill many civilians in the town of Falaja. That time, there was no argument. An accident of the ghastly sort, all too common in war, had occurred. We are not indiscriminately targeting civilian targets, and I think that the very action of the Iraqis themselves demonstrate that they know damn well that we're not attacking civilian targets. Since right now they've dispersed their airplanes into residential areas, they've moved their headquarters into schools, they've moved their headquarters into, into hotel buildings, they put uh, guns and, and things like that on top of uh, high-rise apartment buildings. Uh, under the Geneva Convention, that gives us a perfect right to go after those things if we wanted to, and we haven't done it. All through the onslaught, Iraq replied with Soviet-built Scud missiles, deliberately targeting civilian areas in Saudi Arabia and Israel. Altogether, 81 were fired, 38 at Israel. Opposing the Scuds, American Patriot missiles. They brought down the 29 Scuds that got close enough to threaten Saudi installations. Scuds proved an effective psychological weapon, even though none reached its target. The damage and casualties were caused by debris from Scuds either shot down or simply breaking up in flight. The Battle of the Scuds over Israel. Again, the American Patriots were fired to intercept the incoming missiles. Many were brought down, but in a crowded country like Israel, the debris caused several deaths and injuries. Yet Israel was persuaded not to retaliate. The computerized Patriot anti-missile system was rushed into service from the factory in Massachusetts. And to combat the mid-air breakup of Scuds, it was quickly reprogrammed to target just the warhead. Basically, the computer will determine who's got the best capability of, of uh, intercepting the missile. And the computer will go ahead and designate the unit to engage. I think Patriot is probably the, the, uh, is definitely the king of air defense artillery right now, not only for the United States, but probably in all the free world. Have you ever missed? No, I have not. You pick this mine up, it goes off. You eat five pounds of explosives. Explosives in the human body don't get along. This ain't the war to be out there playing Rambo. Schwarzkopf's Vietnam experience, he'd been decorated for rescuing a soldier from a minefield, made him especially concerned to warn his men of the danger. I didn't realize he had so many types, but we knew that he had a lot of mines out there. They've got a pretty formidable minefield, but uh, we're not going to be stupid about it. We're not just going to send a human wave through this thing. He's got a lot of them from a lot of countries. Who let him get them, we don't know, but we're going to have to deal with them now. The highly effective Viper device was now on active service.
was one more effort to persuade Iraqi troops not to fight to the end. More leaflets were dropped advising surrender. The few who did surrender, dots on a desert horizon, were herded together by Chinook helicopters. Brigadier Christopher Hammerbeck led the British 4th Brigade in his tank Nomad. Out on the western flank of the Allied positions, the desert rats linking with the 1st US Armoured Division thrust across the enemy's land, not into Kuwait as the Iraqis had expected, but northward into Iraq itself. Later, these tankies, as they called themselves, would wheel round, slicing across the north of Kuwait to trap as much of the occupying force as possible. The attack turned into a classic dash. Opposition was, in Schwarzkopf's own words, remarkably light. The British Army's new warrior fighting gear. Inside these battle taxis, as the men prefer to call them, the mechanised infantry prepared for their job. At its most severe, killing enemy soldiers in their foxholes with bayonet and grenade. We do we're killing on a personal basis. The guys at the top there are killing people from kilometres away. We have to get out and actually clear the places, obviously, the grenade, the rifle and the bayonet, if need be. Does it worry you, the thought of using the bayonet? Well, no, I've got loved ones back home and I want to get back to them as much as um, the rest of the guys, so I'm prepared to do anything to get back home. Another new piece of equipment, the multiple launch rocket system, capable of firing ripples of 12 rockets, each containing 644 bombs, to smash artillery positions and tanks. One Iraqi commander later reported that only seven of his 250 men survived such an attack. Not far behind, barrages from more conventional artillery. could catch anyone unawares. just as it had with the air campaign of Operation Desert Storm. The commander of the 1st Armoured Division, Major General Rupert Smith, Beret and Spectacles, briefed his senior officers on the next decisive engagement at night with the Republican Guard. There'd been much talk before the ground assault about the Allies' night fighting superiority. Thank you. 
Here, the equipment proved itself beyond all doubt. Enemy tanks were destroyed, often without return of fire. Most were usually dug in, pointing the wrong way. If Iraqi armor did get in a blow, their shells bounced off Allied tanks, causing, at worst, a slight dent. Daylight, and it was time to consult the maps to chart the course across the barren wasteland, following the battle plan. A long right-hand swing down into the north and center of Kuwait. To their left, the French and Americans had continued pushing deep into Iraq itself. They too were largely unopposed. In the distance, the prisoners began turning up in larger and larger numbers as Iraq's military crumbled away. Everywhere, the wreckage of their army. The British destroyed 200 Republican Guard tanks, losing none themselves. Some had lucky escapes, though. The crew of this reconnaissance tank escaped unhurt when an American plane mistakenly attacked them. Then came tragedy. The Desert Rats heard that nine British soldiers, the youngest 17, died when another American plane hit a warrior vehicle. We moved about 30 metres away in the wagon, uh, waiting for the guns to be blown. And there was just a mass explosion which blew us back in the turret. And then when we looked out and seen the wagon had been hit, we moved round in front of the wagon to help with the casualties. We took a knock yesterday. As you're all grown men, you're all soldiers, and we go on. I'm very proud of you last night. It didn't seem to affect what we did in the slightest. So thank you very much indeed. Across Kuwait's southern border, the Americans stormed through the sand defense walls the Iraqis had thrown up. They proved no protection at all as the first and second US Marine divisions raced into the Emirate. behind a pipe fascine. Its pipes fill up anti-tank ditches in seconds, allowing backup armor to cross. AH-64 Apache attack helicopters. These were the machines that proved so deadly effective in knocking out tanks and other Iraqi vehicles in close combat. The 229th Aviation Brigade destroyed 50 Iraqi tanks in a single encounter. Aptly named Hellfire missiles, yeah. which enabled the Apaches to tear through armor cladding after skimming across the desert to find their targets. The Apaches had been involved in the very first actions of the war. Now they'd be involved in the last. Artillery duels developed. But once more, US firepower proved overwhelming. <laughs> Mechanized infantry poured rapidly across the border, with Kuwaiti advisors aboard to guide their American liberators across the featureless terrain. America's most modern tank, the M1 Abrams, able, like the British Challenger, to fire on the move. 
This was deployed to take on three Republican Guard divisions, each numbering up to 14,000 men and armed with the Soviets' latest T-72 tanks. As the desert rats were finding, the T-72 shells could do little more than dent these machines. On the other hand, hundreds of Iraqi tanks were shattered. It had been less of a battle, more a massacre of machinery. Coalition leaders were now certain of ultimate victory. We are continuing to attack and continue to achieve tremendous success against the Iraqi forces in the KTO. The coalition attack continues to meet with success on the ground, in the air, and at sea. The battle is going extremely well. It has taken our regiments only 36 hours to neutralize an enemy division. The key role of retaking Kuwait City itself went to the Arab forces. Saudis, Omanis, Egyptians, Syrians, men from the Emirates, and above all, Kuwait itself. The Kuwaiti forces, like their Iraqi oppressors, were equipped with the latest Russian tanks, the T-72s. As they dashed across the desert wastes, they were understandably delighted as resistance crumbled and retaking their homeland became merely a matter of time. As the Allies pressed forward, the trickle of Iraqi surrenders turned into a flood as thousands gave themselves willingly into Allied hands. They poured out of their foxholes, almost pitiful in their relief at being able to give up after the long nightmare of bombardment. Iraqi officers had told their conscripts they'd be shot if the Allies captured them, and they were obviously terrified this would happen. Allied soldiers were at pains to calm them. As the captives in their thousands were taken away, smoke columns could be seen on the horizon, burning oil installations. This was the first evidence of Iraq's horrendous scorched earth campaign as its forces fell back. Everywhere, jets of flame blasted into the skies the ultimate act of spiteful vengeance. The flames of Kuwait's oil wealth turning into plumes of smoke, which in turn became clouds of poison. Over 600 oil wells either left spewing crude into the air or set ablaze, as them had always threatened. To the last, Iraq also continued to strike back with Scud missiles. One came down on an American Marine's barracks near the important Allied base at Dharan in Saudi Arabia. It was the single most costly incident suffered by the United States. 28 reserves died. Tuesday, February the 26th, the first Arab forces reach Kuwait City itself. The Iraqis, after a final outburst of looting and destruction, had gone. Seven months of occupation were over. There was jubilation as the Kuwaiti flag, prohibited since early August, was unfurled again. I feel pretty good. Iraq's military defeat was overwhelming when victors met vanquished at a disused airfield in Allied-held southern Iraq to dictate peace terms. Anyway, right? no, Inside the tent, Iraq's two most senior army commanders. They agreed all Allied terms for leaving Kuwait. What nobody knew then was that they'd withdrawn tens of thousands of their best troops and weapons to the north of Iraq to put down anticipated rebellions.
In Kuwait, the most prominent buildings as well as many homes had been looted and burned. Untold numbers of unnamed bodies were mute testament to a reign of Iraqi terror during the occupation. For many of those responsible, the war ended in terror on the Basra Road at a place called Mutla Gap. For miles, vehicles stolen from Kuwait now lay burned and broken, devastated by the final Allied air attack. Both sides of the road, littered with the evidence of an army of looters fleeing in panic. Countless corpses lay where they had died. Ahead, rebellion in the Shiite holy places, put down ruthlessly by the troops Saddam had kept from battle. And in northern Iraq, the tragedy of the Kurds, who'd also risen against Saddam, expecting Allied aid that never came. As thousands fled their failed uprising, they became trapped in barren mountains, freezing and starving. Schwarzkopf said he'd been prevented from finishing the job, but it remains to be seen whether that human tragedy will blunt the tremendous military victory. Darkness at noon the other legacy of Saddam's mother of battles. Burning oil casting another dark cloud over the achievements of Operation Desert Storm. <laughs>